Thank you very much. So thank you very much. And uh, it is my pleasure to be the chairperson for these uh, three talks uh, right now. And we will start with uh, Surya Ramana, who will speak of a problem of Sarkozy. So please, Surya. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Michel. Uh, thank you very much to my uh, dear friends who have organized this program. Uh, Adhikari Dada, uh, Anirban, Saoli, uh, Purshottam, Anup, and uh, others. And of course, uh, great thanks to Balu for uh, uh, causing this opportunity and for everything, you know, <coughs> to use Professor Desiree's phrase, I've known him also for 70 by two years, and it's been a really, really long time. So uh, thank you very much to all. I should like to uh, just add a small caution uh, here. Uh, the internet uh, in uh, HRI can be quite unstable nowadays for some technical reasons. So I might just uh, uh, have to stop my talk mid-sentence. Please don't be alarmed if that happens. I do hope nothing will happen. Okay, so let me get to the <coughs> subject of the talk, which uh, is on a problem of Sarkozy. So this is a problem that I have lectured on many times. Uh, each time uh, we have managed to add some small uh, uh, development to the work we have done so far. So let me just begin by uh, introducing uh, the question, uh, which is like this. So what is the problem uh, that Sarkozy proposed? Uh, Sarkozy, in, in the year uh, 2000, Andras Sarkozy, I think it was just one year before 2000, the paper was published in Acta Math Hungarica in 2000. It was a long list of uh, problems that he was posing for uh, uh, younger mathematicians. I think on the occasion of his uh, uh, 60th birthday or so, I'm not very sure. But uh, it's a list of problems, a lot of uh, interesting problems. So one of the problems uh, uh, in this list uh, is uh, this question, uh, which I state in uh, parts here. Uh, the question uh, combines the, the two classical themes, uh, the Ramsey theoretic uh, problems and uh, Waring's problems. So the question is like this. <laughs> given uh, the S is the set of squares and K is an integer greater than or equal to one. Then you're supposed to find an integer which is now written as little SK. Now, what is this little SK? The definition of little SK is this, uh, for all uh, large integers and any partition of the squares, so over all possible partitions of the squares into K, uh, disjoint subsets, okay, into k disjoint subsets. So for any, for all large enough uh, integers and all partitions, so for for each large enough in integer given a partition, there should exist. Oops, there should exist uh, j such that n can be written as x1, x2, so on up to xm, with each of these summands belonging to the same. Uh, Sj, okay, uh, and the number of summands does not exceed x, Sk. So you have to find the smallest integer Sk, which has the property that, uh, given any k coloring of the squares, all sufficiently large integers have a monochromatic representation. That means can be written as a sum of squares, all summands belonging to the uh, same set of the partition and the number of summands uh, not exceeding sk. Of course, the color, namely the summand that is the, uh, the subset of the partition that is used can vary with n, but each n should have a monochromatic representation as a sum of squares. So, and the question of Sarkozy was to find the smallest uh, integer sk such that uh, uh, this sort of expression is possible. So this is uniform over all partitions. Of course, uh, as soon as uh, such a definition is given, it's natural to ask, is, does such an SK exist at all? Is there such a smallest integer or is it infinite? We will see in the course uh, of the talk that it is not difficult to, to show actually that such an SK exists. 
the question is uh, of uh, sharp bounds for SK. Uh, so let me just move on. So we will restrict ourselves to optimal upper bounds. Uh, yeah, we'll restrict ourselves to optimal upper bounds for SK, TK, and RK for large primes. So let me just say what are SK, TK, and RK. So here are variants of this question that you can immediately pose. Uh, for the set of squares, the number is called SK. So SK is the smallest number such that in any monochromatic, any uh, K coloring of the squares, every sufficiently large integer is uh, expressible as a monochromatic sum of at most SK uh, uh, squares. Now, for the set of primes, one can pose a similar question. So TK is the smallest integer such that for any uh, K coloring of the primes, every sufficiently large integer can be written as a sum of at most TK monochromatic primes. And similarly, QK and uh, RK, you can pose the same question for uh, uh, any higher power rather than simply the squares. Okay, I uh, couldn't resist the temptation of uh, using this notation because I am a bit of a fan of ancient Rome. So you have SPQR uh, for uh, uh, these various sets here. Okay, so uh, now with these notations, so uh, these are the various sort of problems that one can pose. And as you can see, you can basically pose this question for any uh, set instead of the squares, which is an asymptotic basis for the natural numbers. So all uh, large enough natural numbers can be written as sums of elements of that set. Then you can partition that set into k subsets and ask for the smallest integer such that every uh, uh, sufficiently large integer is expressible as a sum of monochromatic uh, terms uh, from this uh, uh, set. So this is a general question that one can pose. Sarkozy posed it for the squares and for the primes, but uh, we will also consider the prime squares, which uh, at least uh, to us personally, uh, Enkar asked us, it's a natural question, and it was uh, independently considered by uh, Gua Hua Chen. Okay, so these are the sort of questions uh, that we have. Now, uh, let me uh, speak of the most obvious coloring uh, that one can consider. So you can uh, partition the squares, uh, uh, the squares or any uh, set. The most natural way of partitioning it would be to use residue classes modulo a suitable integer m. So you fix an integer m and then uh, you use the residue classes to uh, partition the given set. So let's just look at an example for the prime speed. So you take m any integer and fix k to be one plus uh, the number of invertible classes modulo m. So one more than the number of invertible classes modulo m. So then uh, uh, let a1, a2, ak minus one denote the invertible classes modulo m. So now you can partition the primes in the following manner. Uh, so you put all the primes which lie in a particular uh, residue, invertible residue class modulo m in uh, one of the sets. So you have k minus one such subsets of the prime, sorry, excuse me, uh, k minus one such subsets. So k minus one such uh, subsets of the primes uh, and uh, the last one, you can you take the primes that divide the modulus itself. So we have k uh, subsets of the primes, and this is a disjoint partition of the prime. So this is a coloring of the prime. So now uh, let us uh, try to see how many summands are required if I want to express a number which is a square, uh, which is a number greater than m square and is divisible by m. Let us try to see how many summands we require in order to express such an n as a monochromatic sum using this partition. So suppose that n can be written as x1, x2, xt with all xt, xi's are of the same color. What this means is that uh, the xi's all belong to a particular, uh, one particular uh, 
element of this partition. Okay. So suppose n has such a representation. I uh, claim that t, the number of summands is at least m. So the reason for this is quite simple. So let us uh, see the reason. Suppose n can be written as x1, x2, so on up to xt as a sum like this. And all the xi's belong, let us say, to the invertible class A model. Okay. This means that n is equal to A times uh, because all the xi's are a mod m, this means that m is a times t mod m. But m divides n and a is co prime to m, which means therefore that m must divide t. And therefore t must be at least m. Otherwise, if n is, if the xi's all don't belong to the same residue class mod m, then the color that is being used is the last one, which consists of uh, prime divisors of n. So that means all the xi's are actually divisors of n. But n is larger than m square, and each of these summands can be at most m, and therefore the number of summands should again be at least capital M. So either way, either uh, 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 arguing, I mean, uh, no matter how you represent n as a monochromatic sum, you're forced to have at least m summand. Okay, so this is one particular coloring of the primes, but naturally, if you're looking at uh, TK, which is defined uniformly over all colorings, this uh, lower bound here will automatically give a lower bound for TK itself. So TK, uh, the number we are seeking for the primes is at least M. And since, of course, writing M as K times M by 1 plus phi M, because 1 plus phi M is the definition of K, so you write it like this. And then you choose a suitable m. Uh, then you can uh, you choose a suitable square-free m dependent on k. Then uh, you can see that t k is at least k log log k. Okay, you can make a more uh, refined calculation. And indeed, uh, this is what uh, Egibari and Encar did uh, in the first paper written on the subject of Sharpe's problem. And they proved that TK is at least e to the gamma, the usual uh, uh, numbers that appear in prime number theory, e to the gamma times k log log k. Okay, so this is uh, the lower bound for TK. It's an obvious lower bound that comes out of simply partitioning the primes using uh, an appropriate modulus. Uh, you can similarly get lower bounds for this uh, for the numbers uh, analogous numbers. Uh, so let us just uh, have these lower bounds. Oops. Yeah. <clears throat> so all these lower bounds are of order k. That's firstly the important thing to notice. E, so for the primes, tk is bigger than e to the gamma times k times a fudge factor, which is log log k. For the squares, it's k times another factor, which is exponential uh, log 2 log k by log log k. For the prime squares, it's the same sort of the bound for squares uh, gives one for prime squares because whenever you color the, all the squares, you end up inducing a coloring on the squares of prime numbers. So you get therefore uh, these lower bounds. Notice that this uh, log log k comes from the uh, factor m by phi m which is basically the reciprocal of the density of invertible classes mod m. And similarly, these factors, the exponential factors here, arise from the density of uh, squares, uh, uh, invertible squares modulo m. Uh, uh, so the reciprocal of these densities gives you these extra factors. So what you want to remember is that the lower bounds are all of order k. Uh, times uh, fudge factor, which comes from appropriate density. So now what are the upper bounds? Uh, uh, so everybody and NCAP in the same paper that I spoke of, uh, they showed that TK is less than uh, 1500 KQ. So you see that upper bound was of the order of the cube of K, whereas the lower bounds are of the order of K. And similarly, for the squares, they had a bound which is even bigger. It's k log k to the five. Mm. So then uh, Olivier and uh, myself, we worked on this question, and we could uh, obtain an upper bound 
which was the same order as the lower bound. Uh, in principle, you can even write down a constant here. So up to this constant, uh, we essentially got the optimal answer. So TK is K log log. Then uh, subsequently in 2015, uh, uh, Akilesh, who was then a student of mine, we worked for squares and we got the bound. So we reduced their K log K to the power of five to K square to K to the power of two plus epsilon. Then uh, uh, in 2018, Olivier, Gyan and myself, uh, we could get uh, for uh, the squares a bound of order K, but please notice, and this is still uh, an annoying thing that we have not been able to settle. Our exponential factor had a, has a three log two rather than the log two in the lower bound that is there. So we are off by uh, a power of three uh, here. Otherwise, uh, you have the same uh, uh, factor log K by log log K. So you have log two here, whereas our upper bound is a three log. Uh, I will explain uh, uh, at the end of the talk uh, why we get a three log two. And essentially the obstruction is counting points, uh, uh, getting the correct count for points on a certain variety of uh, finite field. It just turns out that we are not able to do what uh, should be the um, correct answer. If we are able to, we would be able to replace at least this three by two without any other change uh, in, in our method. And perhaps if the method was refined, you could get a, the same bound here, but I'm not so sure if two log two is the correct answer or log at this stage. So uh, that's the result for the squares. Now recently, uh, uh, so uh, for the prime squares, uh, Chen had obtained in 2016 the upper bound uh, like we had obtained for the squares with Achilles, RK is less than K to the two plus epsilon. And uh, uh, Gyan, myself, and uh, uh, Malaysian, who was a student at HRI uh, earlier, uh, we uh, could get an analogous bound as we got for the squares with Olivier for the prime squares. Now this uh, uh, we got some time back, being in preprint form, only recently uh, could we put it in final form, and therefore uh, this is. Uh, the last uh, result we have, which is about I mean, published say, last year. So uh, this is the story so far uh, about the upper bounds and lower bounds. Uh, as he said, for the primes, we have basically solved it uh, some years ago with Olivier. Uh, and for the squares, we have gotten close, but still there is this extra annoying factor of two. So let us now look at how one obtains uh, these bounds. So here is a toy bound uh, that I uh, sketched to give you uh, the method, to give you uh, an idea of the method. So uh, let me sketch a proof for uh, TK being less than less than K to the power of four. So what I want to prove is that uh, if you give me, uh, if you color the set of prime numbers in K different colors, then every large enough number can be written as a sum of utmost k to the power of four primes, all having the same color. So I'm going to sketch a proof of this fact uh, for you just now. So uh, let us suppose that this is a coloring of the primes in k colors. So p is written as a union of uh, k uh, subsets which are disjoint. Now let's take a large uh, integer n uh, so n to two n, and consider the intersections of these pi's with this with this interval, and call them the Roman uh, pi's instead of the script pi's. So you have uh, pi is equal to this, and p is the uh, full set of primes in the interval n to two n. Okay, then p naturally is the union of all these uh, uh, capital pi's, and simply by the pigeonhole principle, at least one color. There's at least one index i, which has more than one by k, more than or equal to one by k of the total primes in the interval n to two n, simply because there are k of them. Okay, so let us uh, denote this particular index, there may be more than one by uh, s. So just choose one which has more than one by k of the primes in the interval, and uh, let us call it uh, s. 
and uh, let us denote by E S the additive energy of S. Now, the additive energy of S is a fundamental uh, notion in additive combinatorics. Uh, it's one of the most basic tools in additive problems. You uh, uh, use this additive energy to get lower bounds on uh, representation of integers as sums of particular uh, as sums of elements of particular sets. So ES is the number, the definition of ES, the additive energy of a set S is the number of solutions to this equation. So it basically counts the repetitions in additive representation. So X1 plus X2 equal X3 plus X4 with all the Xi's belonging to S. Account for this, uh, the number of solutions to this uh, equation is called the additive energy. Now, since S is this, uh, subset pi and pi is a subset of the full set of primes plainly from the definition it follows that the additive energy of pi is less than the additive energy of the full set of primes in the interval n to pi. So the arbitrariness in the choice of uh, pi is gone when you use this inequality. So now I just need an upper bound for the number of solutions to this equation with the xi's being any prime number in the interval n to 2n. Uh, that's a very classical uh, equation that's been studied from the time of Schneerman's density theorem and so on. It's absolutely well known. And you can very easily using uh, standard tools nowadays, any basic C or circle method, whatever you like, you can immediately write down an upper bound, which is of the form, which is the expected form, namely n cubed by log n to the power of four. Uh, because uh, there are n by log n choices for the first three variables, and the fourth one has a chance of being a prime, which is given by one by log. So this is the expected up about, and you get uh, that very easily using any uh, basic tool in analytic number theory. Now the point is, since we are uh, we have this bound for s, uh, and s is large in cardinality it's it has one by k of the total set of primes in uh, in the interval you see that cardinality of s is greater than than n by k log n uh, and what you get uh, from here you can rewrite this particular bound for es in this form es is less than less than s cubed k cubed by log n. now there is a absolutely classical Cauchy Schwartz application, uh, which is again fundamental to additive uh, number theory, which relates the cardinality of the uh, set uh, S plus S, namely the set of integers which are sums of two elements of S to the additive energy and the cardinality of S itself. So, this really, this inequality explains why additive energy upper bounds are so important for lower bounds for representation. Okay, so this is a very standard classical uh, Cauchy Schwarz application, and it gives you this. So, if you plug in the bound that I uh, wrote down above into this Cauchy Schwarz application and uh, recall that S has uh, at least one by K of the total number of primes, then uh, here there's uh, uh, evidently uh, okay. So, then you cancel the S cube and you get a cardinality of S. You put an N by K log N, K cube. The log n's cancel off, and you conclude that s plus s has uh, the cardinality of s plus s is 2n by l plus 1, is at least 2n by l plus 1, where l is some constant times k to the 4. So, what this means, uh, and this is a very simple but uh, the, a remarkable fact, is that you started with a set of prime numbers s, which uh, uh, is large in the set of prime numbers between n and 2n. But as everybody knows, the, num the set of primes itself is a very sparse set of the total integers in n and total integers in the interval n to 2n. Nevertheless, we concluded using additive energy and so on that the sum set of this set of primes has actually positive density in the interval 2n to 4n. It has more than uh, you know uh, 2n by L plus one elements where L is C K to the four. So we starting from a set of primes, we have just added it to itself and arrived at a set which has positive density in the full set of integers. So this is a classical move again in additive number theory and explains, uh, I mean, this is the basis 
of uh, various methods for uh, old methods for trying to attack goldback problem and uh, things like that. So uh, we have this particular thing. Now, what's the use of this in our context? Now, we know that S has positive density in the interval uh, 2n to 4n. Okay. So this, uh, if you call uh, A as S plus S, then S plus S has positive density. So this is the set A, and A has more than this many elements. One would expect that if I went on adding A to itself, I'll eventually get an interval because A has positive density in uh, an interval. So if you added it to itself sufficiently many times, you should probably generate a whole interval. Of course, that is not true. For example, A can consist of even numbers. And so no matter how many times you add, you're going to only get even numbers and never a full interval. But then that tells you that the, the right thing to expect is that if you add A to itself, you should at least get a long arithmetic progression. This is true, and this is the basis of uh, several theorems called addition theorems uh, in uh, additive number theory. And one uh, such theorem, which is relatively late, is Sarkozy's, uh, so a theorem of Sarkozy himself, called Sarkozy's finite addition theorem. So what does Sarkozy's finite addition theorem say? Uh, it tells you that uh, if A is a subset of 1 to n, and A has a positive density in this interval. This has nothing to do with prime numbers. Just take any subset which has positive density in the interval. And then uh, there are numbers D and H, which depend only on this density. So there is some explicit upper bounds here. D is less than K, uh, H is less than 118 times K. And such that if you add A to itself H times, it would contain an n term arithmetic progression. You see, n is this number n here. So it would contain an n term arithmetic progression to modulus d. Okay, n term arithmetic progression of this type. The only thing you don't control is where the arithmetic progression starts. But you have an n term arithmetic progression of this type. So it has uh, it's just multiples of d. Uh, if you start with a uh, in an initial interval. If you translate, if you take A in an interval like n to 2n, uh, as we are uh, doing, you will actually get an arithmetic progression with the first term and uh, you know not, not just multiples of D. Okay, so what Sarkozy's theorem tells you and the remarkable thing is that the modulus of the arithmetic progression is bounded by the density explicitly there's a clear bound, uh, you don't lose anything, the density bounds this. And uh, also it tells you that the number of summands that you need, uh, so the number of times you need to add A to itself to achieve this is bounded again explicitly in terms of the density. Okay, so this is uh, Sharpos's uh, finite addition theorem. Of course, this theorem itself is a culmination of a uh, number of results in the literature. And this was itself refined by Lev so we nowadays have a, uh, the sharpest form of this theorem, uh, which I will uh, get to uh, uh, in a little while. So therefore, uh, oops, I don't know what's happening now. Sorry, the screen has changed a bit. Are you all, are you able to see the screen properly or? Can you reduce it a little bit as it was I don't know before? How to reduce this thing? Uh, gosh. I'm out of full screen. Maybe just double click. Okay. I will have to stop this here and start again. <laughs> it's almost completely visible to me. So just a little bit on the margin on the right is not there. Let me just see. Oops.
So during this break, if some of you has some question, it's uh, time to ask. Any question? You can use the chat also to ask your question. I will uh, give them to Surya. Uh, uh, can you now see it? No. Not yet. No. No. Uh, okay. No. I just want to share the screen. Ah, yeah. I have to share the screen. Yeah. I'll share the screen. Excuse me. Is it okay? Not yet. No, no, we do not see your screen. Ah. Ah, okay. No? No, it's, it's okay. Okay. Good. Right. Great. Sorry. Sorry for the uh, interruption. Yeah. Right. So, where were we? Uh, this. Next. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, this is uh, where I was. That, uh, Sarkozy's uh, finite addition theorem tells you that if you, if you take a subset of 1 to n, which is itself dense, and you know the density, so this k here representing the density, then you know that if you add a to itself sufficiently many times, and that number of times is controlled by the density, uh, then you have an arithmetic progression of uh, length n, whose modulus is also controlled by the density. Okay, so this is the key thing. Now, uh, in this situation, if you now uh, apply it to what we have, so you take uh, S, which is a subset of the primes. So this primes denoted with blue. So S has uh, uh, one by K of the primes uh, in it. Uh, then we, we have seen that S plus S has positive density. And if you add S plus S to itself H times, so that's equivalent to adding S to itself two H times, then 2HS will contain a long arithmetic progression, an arithmetic progression of n terms uh, with a modulus d, which is controlled entirely by the density. Now, this is very nice. So you have shown that every there are n elements. So the, the n terms of this AP can all be written as exactly as sum of 2H elements of S. Exactly 2H, not at most 2H. So it, this, this AP lies inside this set 2Hs, okay? So the AP has, uh, I mean, each term in this AP can be written as a sum of 2H elements of S. And H is controlled by the density, which is very good, but we don't want an AP, we want an interval. So here is a small, but very crucial, very nice and crucial observation of NCAR and, uh, and uh, uh, Egivari which is simply that S, of course, we are dealing with a set of primes. So it contains a number which is co-prime to every number less than the bound for the density. You see, there's a bound for the density. And since S is in n to 2n, and n is uh, at your choice, it's a large integer. And this de the modulus of this arithmetic progression is bounded just by the density. You have, you can just choose practically any element of S would be co-prime to all integers up to the density, uh, up to the modulus of the arithmetic progression. So the net result is your arithmetic progression has a modulus, which is co-prime to an element of S. And the number of terms in this arithmetic progression is larger than this element of S, because the elements of S lie between n and 2n, whereas your arithmetic progression is between 2n and 4n. Therefore, you have an AP with a modulus that is co-prime to a number and number of terms larger than that number. And so the arithmetic progression represents all distinct classes modulo that number x. Therefore, every integer can actually be written as an element of that arithmetic progression times a multiple of x. And this holds for every uh, integer, except that, of course, the, this uh, number r need not be positive uh, if n is not sufficiently large. So what we have seen using Sarkozy's finite addition theorem is that every integer can be written as an element of this arithmetic progression plus a multiple of s uh, x, and x is an element of s. Now, 
the arithmetic progression each term of this arithmetic progression a is itself a sum uh, it can be written as a sum of 2h elements of s and h is controlled by the density so if i can bound the number of r the number r appearing here again in terms of density then i am done then i would have shown that for uh, you know large enough integers can be written as uh, uh, sums of elements of s and i know that i have explicit bounds on the number of sum now this can be done for every integer but for integers in a certain interval it can be done and using this one can conclude for example so this is the sort of conclusion we have you start with a set of primes primes so you start with the full primes you divide the primes into k subsets you choose one which has at least 1 by k of the total primes you apply this uh, additive energy bound and everything and finally you conclude that using sarkozy's finite addition theorem that every integer in this interval this 236 ln to 237 ln where l is uh, this number which is entirely given by the density 180 times some absolute constant times k power 4 every integer in this interval can be written as x1 plus x2 plus xm with all the xis lying in s so you see that you have represented every integer in this interval as a monochromatic sum as a sum of elements from a particular uh, subset of the partition uh, a subset which is which has at least 1 by k of the total primes now the point is that these intervals so with each n you have associated an interval where you can represent all integers as required and the point is that these intervals themselves as you vary n they intersect and so you cover a neighborhood of infinity so you you change n to n plus 1 and this interval that you get changes to another interval the one corresponding to n plus 1 but all these intervals intersect and therefore you successfully represent all sufficiently large integers as monochromatic sums of primes so that's what uh, is written here i n is the intersection of i n and i n plus 1 is not empty and therefore you have uh, succeeded in representing all large enough integers as monochromatic sums of primes so what does this uh, finally mean you can write this down as a strategy so you can write the principle as a lemma okay so this uh, finally uh, we uh, kind of uh, ironed it out a bit and put it in uh, in this paper with uh, gyan and olivier and the uh, lemma is uh, this so suppose you have any subset nothing to do with the primes just any subset of an interval which is written as n to n plus l okay and define ems as the number of solutions to this equation where m is at your choice so this is the m fold additive energy suppose you can get a bound for the m fold additive energy which is s to the cardinality of s to the 2m times some d by l now cardinality s to the 2m by l is basically what is the expected bound for the number of solutions okay because uh, the chance that uh, you see each of these variables belongs to s that gives you s choices for all variables except the last one and the chance that the last one belongs to s is naively speaking the cardinality of s by the length of the interval which is s by l so the uh, expected upper bound for ems would be cardinality s to the 2m by l so this d represents some sort of a distortion from the uh, naively expected upper bound so if you can prove such an upper bound where d is some number uh, l is some l is the length of this interval and cardinality s to the 2m okay and l is uh, larger than n greater than this distortion as well essentially and if this set s contains a number which is co prime to all small primes <coughs> so all primes essentially not exceeding this d then every sufficiently large number can be written as a sum of elements of s so what i am telling you is that is a condition uh, based on an upper bound for the additive energy m fold additive energy so if you get an appropriate shape upper bound for the m fold additive energy you can just plug this lemma in and conclude that every large enough integer 
can be written as a sum of elements of this set S. Now it's a question of bounding the number of summands, which you can easily control uh, by limiting the size of this integer. And so for each uh, 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 interval n of the form n to 2n, you choose a particular S from your partition. You apply this, you get an interval where every integer can be written as a sum of uh, elements from this S. Then uh, you keep varying the N, the uh, choice of color, the S would vary with the N. Nevertheless, the intervals in which you can represent all integers as monochromatic sums, those intercell intervals will intersect and therefore their union will give you uh, all sufficiently large uh, integers and you have solved the problem of Sarkozy for a particular set for which you can get the appropriate bound. Uh, so the question then becomes, oops, excuse me, I lost. Sorry, this seems to be more serious problem. Yes, uh, therefore, this is the uh, lemma that I spoke of. And now uh, in the remaining, how many minutes do I have? Uh, 10, uh, well, ten, ten, well ten. Eight. Eight. Pardon? eight minutes, eight. Eight, okay, yeah. I'll just try to uh, uh, finish in eight minutes. So you see, therefore, this is the uh, strategy for obtaining uh, uh, the results that I uh, mentioned. Now the question is, how do I bound this uh, additive energy? Okay, so this is the result that we had with Olivier. So if you take a set of uh, primes, which is large enough in between n and 2n, then its additive energy is bounded by S cube log k by uh, log n. Uh, th this is basically uh, the best uh, possible bound that one can get. So the problem was reduced to bounding the additive energy and uh, uh, this uh, is the bound that we had. Now, when we obtain this result, Matomaki uh, also uh, obtained another result, which is closely related with this. So I just would like to mention it for a moment. So uh, if you take uh, two uh, subsets of the primes, which have relative density alpha and beta, then she uh, said that uh, uh, the relative density of the sum set has this. Uh, the relative density of some set is at least this much, okay? This result is optimal. And uh, Matomaki uses the method of uh, Green and Tau to arrive uh, at this result. Now, the method that uh, Ramare and uh, myself use, which is based on Ramare and Rusha, uh, gives the same result on this problem, but with a factor of half. So it's lower than this by a factor of half. Uh, essentially because the additive energy in our uh, bound had a factor of two. So this uh, recently, uh, I mean, okay, a couple of years ago, we have uh, refined, though we are still working on a sharper version of this result. So by uh, refining the method of uh, Olivier and uh, Python, uh, we have uh, been able to recover uh, the result of Matomaki, but in a slightly sharper form, namely we get a bound for the additive energy from which again, one can uh, get this result back. Okay, this uh, method uh, it uses the one of uh, Ramare and Ruja, Ramare and myself, whereas this depends on the method of Green and Tau. So uh, just to point that out. Now let's, uh, to end the talk, let me simply tell you how, very quickly, how the additive energy is bounded. So additive energy, as I said, is just account for the number of solutions to this equation. Now, uh, this, with the von Mangold function lambda, you can easily write 
the additive energy uh, as satisfying this inequality. So the number of solutions to this equation times log n, which is the weight for uh, each of these solutions being primes uh, in n to 2n, must be less than uh, or equal to uh, lambda n time of lambda evaluated at x1 plus x2 minus x3. Basically, what we are doing is testing for when x1 plus x2 minus x3 is a prime. In order to count the number of solutions to this, all I, I weaken it to simply asking, okay, tell me how many, uh, for how many triples is x1 plus x2 minus x3 a prime between n and t n. Okay, so <clears throat> one has this as the starting point, then you use uh, standard methods in analytic numbers. So you have a C wide entity, uh, which is uh, well known, uh, and uh, a basic C wide entity, which you put in, eventually use additive characters to represent uh, the resulting summations and then uh, resulting congruence conditions that come out. And so when you do all of this, these are very standard uh, steps in treating the problem. So skipping a number of standard steps, uh, you arrive at uh, uh, the fact that your additive energy times logarithm of n is bounded by a sum of this type. So here q is uh, an integer parameter that goes up to logarithm of n power 4. You have mu q, and then you have uh, essentially the cube of the Fourier transform of the set s that you started with, which is just sigma e n t n in s. Okay, so these are sums that are very uh, you know, integral to analytic number theory, the large C concerns itself a lot with these sums and so on. So we would like bounds when Q is very small in relation to N, okay? For all other uh, sizes of Q, we uh, use standard methods and arrive at acceptable error and so they are treated. Now to treat this sum, one splits it as Q dividing an appropriately chosen square free integer and others. The other integers, because there's a new Q, the other integers are necessarily big. And so you arrive at two things. One is to estimate this sum where Q is large, but less than log n to the power of four. And you have a sum of this sort that you have to estimate. Now, this is a sum that Olivier had treated before, and this is treated by what uh, he is called the improved large sieve for the primes. So this is a very, uh, the large sieve itself, of course, is a very standard uh, inequality in uh, analytic number theory. And one of uh, Lamaray's results was an improvement of this for the primes. Now, this large sieve is a, this uh, inequality of uh, Olivier's is extremely closely related to the restriction theorem that uh, became famous later on uh, in the work of Tau and Green. So it's it's basically that uh, Olivier's uh, large C uh, treats Ferry series, whereas uh, what is Tau's large C for the primes, which essentially gives the restriction theorem for the primes quite immediately, it treats a general well space sequence. So those uh, who are familiar with the theory of the large C will recognize that uh, this is a special case. So, uh, but of course, this is uh, much uh, before. <clears throat> so in, in any case, using Olivier's uh, large C, we, uh, so using Olivier's large C, we treat uh, the, pro the uh, case where Q is, this parameter Q is large. And then we have, we are reduced to treating the case when the parameter Q divides a particular fixed square field number. This problem reduces actually to a completely combinatorial problem modulo this square free number. And you can state that problem without reference to number theory itself. Uh, because that square free number, uh, so when you look at the problem mod the square free number by Chinese reminder theorem, it will split into a product uh, mod each prime dividing this number. And finally, the problem that you actually have can be stated in purely combinatorial terms. So the, the, the question is like this. Suppose I have a finite product of finite sets, okay? Just the finite product of finite sets. And I take any subset of the index set and I take two subsets in this product. The question is estimate the number of pairs belonging to one belonging to one of the sets, the second to the other, 
which differ in prescribed coordinates. So how many pairs A comma B are there such that the ith coordinate of A differs from the ith coordinate of B, where I belongs to a prescribed set of indices. The question is, can you bound this number? So this, uh, when bounded, is gives the solution to the, so allows you that bound, if you substitute into this, uh, you, you finish the problem. Okay, so you have essentially this bound, and with this, you're done. Now, the thing is, we originally with Olivier, we got an extra factor two, which we have uh, removed uh, with uh, Malaysian and Gyatrakash, so as to be able to recover Matomaki's uh, result. But we are still in the process of refining the error terms and this thing, so that uh, should be done shortly. Anyway, let me just summarize the whole thing by saying that we had a problem in Z, namely to bound the uh, number of solutions to a certain uh, linear equation with the variables lying in a given set of integers. By using several other, I mean, a number of devices, but mainly remember is large C, which is, uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, the, related to the restriction theorem for the primes, you are able to reduce it to a problem in Z mod U. So this is what one calls the local problem. Then by means of uh, actually two applications of holders inequality, you finally reduce to a problem modulo prime numbers. And this is a problem that you solve. And with that, you get the appropriate, the required bound for the additive energy. So there's a progression from Z to Z mod UZ, where U is a square free number to finally a question in prime numbers. This is the strategy for the primes, and this has remained the strategy for all the problems that we have considered. So for the squares, when you do this, the problem that you get at the end is this, a local problem in the squares. So let's take any integer t and uh, k, an integer between 1 and t, and see a fixed uh, element of uh, finite field, uh, in fact, uh, prime 1. And so FP for a, a given prime. And then look at these equations. So zi, j squared, these are variables. Uh, xi squared plus yj squared plus c, i going from 1 to k, j going from 1 to k. Now, the number of solutions we can show is uh, satisfies this bound for k between 1 and t by t. Okay, and P large enough, I have not written the exact the lower bound for P, but one can write it. So for K between one and T over two, we have this bound. And in principle, one would expect that this is true for K between one and T. So this variety that you have here, the, if you find the shape a little curious, it's simply because it results from two applications of holders inequality. So this uh, ZIJ is being related to XI squared and YJ squared just come from holders in equality. So you, for uh, the squares, you get this. For higher powers, you can write down a similar variety very easily. And this really controls the final uh, part of the bound. Namely, you get a bound for SK, which is K times some fudge factor. And to get the optimal fudge factor, you have to get, uh, uh, at least by this method, an optimal count for the number of points on this uh, variety. So for squares, we had a bound, which is k exponential 3 log 2. If uh, the correct count for the number of points on this could be obtained, you could just by, I mean, simply copy the rest of the method and you would get 2 log. Whether you get log 2 itself, I really do not know whether log 2 is the correct answer or not. Uh, some on, you know, on Mondays, Wednesdays and Fridays, I think it's one thing, on Tuesdays and others, I think it's the other. So I, I just can't make up my mind if 2 log 2 or log 2 is the right answer. But I know that if I can get the right count for the number of points on this variety, I can at least get uh, uh, 3 log 2 to 2 log. So with this, uh, let me stop. I'm uh, sorry for uh, technical issues. Thank you very much, Surya. Thank you. Uh, so, have I exceeded the time much? Yes, we, we have less than five minutes before the next uh, lecture. So oh, sorry, maybe sorry. We, have, 
So I, you, you, you were speaking of monochromatic uh, sums, but I see that you are very familiar with the colors when we <laughs> look at your slides. So congratulations. And thank you for this beautiful talk and the lively talk with the many colors, colorful talk. And so uh, maybe we have time just for one question. Is there some question? No, okay, so uh, it's better because we have now uh, four minutes before the next talk. So thanks again and uh, thank meet you very much. In, in five minutes. <laughs>